um, you've, you've had your lessons from a, a, a wiser instructor, and you've got your dictionary, and you've got your grammar, and you sit down and you start that laborious, excruciating process of trying to figure out what on earth is actually going on. And that's even with the easy text to begin with. Um, so one of the things I was thinking about generally on the topic of the conference and, and what I was going to say was, you know, what, what's my method when I'm translating? As I said, I don't do it for anybody else's purposes. I just do it so the text is in a language, English, with which I'm more comfortable and can think about it a little more freely. Um, and I realised my method is the student-y one. That is to say, I take the text, quite often I, I handwrite it out, um, transliterate it if necessary, speed things up a bit, I pass it, I fill in the bits of the grammar I'm sure of, I fill in the words that are pretty straightforward and that I'm quite confident of the meaning of, and then for everything else I just go to the appropriate dictionary. Um, and I look at the entry for what I think the word is, and that's quite often not necessarily right. Um, and when I finally have found the one I'm pretty sure it's meant to be, I look at what's listed in the entries for the meanings, and I pick the one that's most most fitting and seems most plausible in the context. That doesn't seem a particularly unreasonable method, I don't think, and I'm sure most of us actually have done that, certainly at some point, probably still continue to. Uh, no, no matter how far we come along, we still have to go and look in the dictionary sometimes. And believe me, even with the greatest Sanskritists, they do it an awful lot. Um, so if I've got a particularly awkward language I'm working with, so one of the languages I study, for instance, is Gothic Avestan, that's a beast of a language to work with. I mean, it really is. <laughs> you know, where you've actually got the word attested and listed in the lexicon, you've also got possibly, mm, nobody really knows, or you've got 12 different meanings by three Avestanists who even in and of themselves, they can't decide what they think that word is, so they give multiple meanings for it, depending on what they think happens. Um, but something like Avestan, it's, you know, it's the oldest Iranian language, it's very closely related to Vedic. Lexically, grammatically, they're very similar in many respects. Uh, so you can go over to the Sanskrit dictionary, actually, and you, you look at the structure of the word, and you go, okay, what would that be in Sanskrit? Oh, I'll see if there's actually an entry for it in the Sanskrit dictionary instead. Oh, okay, there is. Maybe it means that. Oh, there isn't. Start philologizing. Um, but yes, you know, mostly that's kind of what you do when you're working with the comparative method. If I know a language a bit better, or it's somehow easier to work and translate with, or I'm feeling particularly cocky, I just go straight for the philological method and I analyse the word form and I look at the prefixes and the suffixes and go, well, that clearly has that altering effect on the word. I look at the stem or the root and try and work with that. Um, that doesn't work out very well, very often. Um, <laughs> but mostly, I use the dictionary. Um, I trained as a philologist for a while, and it's training I'm very glad that I had. It's not a discipline that I discovered in the end was particularly to my tastes. Everybody's very concerned about the length of a back vowel in the interconsonantal position in that northern dialect of the language in the fourth century. I thought, well, oh, that's fascinating. But what did that word actually mean in its reception <laughs> context to the audience and the popular literary milieu they were surrounded by at the time? And how did they understand that? That might be a more useful question we could ask, actually, about this language. Um, and of course, actually, what I'm talking about mostly here, of course, are classical languages, because that's what I work with. And because that's a very different thing from working with a modern language, especially natural translation, you can't ask someone. Unfortunately, there are no Vikings around to help with Old Norse anymore. It's very frustrating. It's very inconsiderate, in fact, but it's a situation we have to deal with. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. <laughs> I see a new version of the Edda coming on now. <laughs> but yeah, I'm one of those kind of textual historians. Those are my concerns, those are my interests, and that's how, how I approach the study of language. I should say Sanskrit is just my day job. Um, you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time doing the Sanskrit. I worry about engaging young audiences in taking an interest in Sanskrit and historical linguistics in the ancient world, um, which is a whole different challenge. <laughs> um, but when I'm doing this, and I'm thinking about the, the cultural context and narrative, which is my real interest, the, the uses of narrative, the forms it takes, the motivations behind storytelling, and I sit down and look at the act of translation, the kind of questions that I start to think about are how are these words acting in this context? Which of their meanings are the ones most applicable here? 
is that in fact even knowable? Um, who is the audience for this translation? Is it myself? More often than not. Just a casual inquirer, and I'm sure we've all had those when somebody finds out you speak a language and they go, oh, how, how would you say this? Or um, say something in Sanskrit. <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 yes, oh yes, tattoos. <laughs> Beckham's so popular in the Oriental Studies Department at Oxford. Um, maybe it's a colleague, it's the wider scholarly community, it's the interested public, it's the disinterested public that you're trying to inflict these texts upon. Um, why are we even translating this text? And these are the kind of questions I wanted to pose, that I wanted to think about, that I have no intention of actually answering. Um, I'm going to hand over to the discussion for that. Um, but yes, so one of the things I wanted to talk about was whether a translation, depending on its audience, is meant to convey the lexemes and the grammatical relationships of the original text as faithfully as possible, which we've, we've discussed quite a great deal of, or whether it's the sense of the text that's trying to be conveyed, this formal versus dynamic equivalence. Um, so to begin with, I want to begin in West Africa uh, with an ethnography, because that seems appropriate for a talk on Sanskrit. Um, and to begin with a paper called Shakespeare in the Bush. And I don't know if anyone may be familiar with this at all. It's enshrined in the canon of cultural anthropology. Uh, it, it's kind of every reader of cultural anthropology will have this article reprinted in it somewhere along the lines. Um, I, th I think of this as the hilarity of Hamlet. Uh, it's when translation can go awry. So it's 1966, London is swinging, Oxford not so much, and a young cultural anthropologist <laughs> <laughs> called Laura Bohannon uh, is setting off to do some fieldwork with the Tiv tribe in West Africa. But she has a, an unexpected experience there which resulted in her writing this paper. So. I'll, I'll try and give a brief summary of the paper. I strongly recommend you read it. It's very short, very engaging. Um, but she begins by explaining how, before setting off from Oxford, she was discussing the new season of Shakespeare at Stratford, as one does down the pub, actually, in Oxford. That's perfectly normal chat, um, for better or worse. And she quotes one of her friends who says, you Americans often have difficulty with Shakespeare. He was, after all, a very English poet and one can easily misinterpret the universal by misunderstanding the particular. Good casual banter. Um, and so she writes, I protested that human nature is pretty much the same the whole world over. At least the general plot and motivation of the greater tragedies would always be clear everywhere, although some details of custom might have to be explained and difficulties of translation might produce other slight changes. To end an argument we could not conclude, my friend gave me a copy of Hamlet to study in the African bush. It would, he hoped, lift my mind above its primitive surroundings. I choose to read that as ironic. Um, and possibly I might, by prolonged meditation, achieve the grace of correct interpretation. Yes, the grace of correct interpretation of Sanskrit. And it, uh, of, of, sorry, of Shakespeare, we'll get to that. <laughs> as though Shakespeare himself is revelatory text. Um, so I'll, I'll move on to a summary and just give you some selected highlights of some of the discussion that she has in the tribe and, and reproduces. So essentially she goes to the remotest area that she can find uh, where these, these people are, expecting she's going to see lots of ancient and increasingly rare ceremonies, um, but has neglected the slight practicalities that affect this, this community during the season that she's there. So when she arrives, the swamps have completely closed them off from everyone, so they can't go and get other elders to help them with their ceremonies. So the women brew beer, and the men get drunk from dawn. And that's every day, for the whole time she's there. Um, but she doesn't... <laughs> bless her. She doesn't really feel that these drinking sessions are becoming of her high-minded activities that she's there for, and doesn't want to solicit any information from them about their rights when they're drunk. And, to use British term, they don't want to talk shop in the pub. So she spends most of her time sat in her tent alone reading Hamlet. And after two months, she thinks she's actually found the correct interpretation of the text, by really ruminating on this on her own. Um, so what sounds like the elders just being sick and tired of how rude and antisocial she's being, one morning she's popped in thinking she's got there before the drinking session begins. And 
only to find that they've actually they've already started. And they say, no, no, enough of this. You're going to sit down, you're going to drink with us, and you're going to tell us a story for once. And this is a culture that regards storytelling as a very high art. It's very important to them. There's a great deal of stylistics that goes into it. And she insists, you know, I really am not a storyteller. I won't do this any justice. And it's very, very difficult to explain Shakespeare. Um, but they, they're having none of it. If this book's so great that it can make her be antisocial, then it's obviously worth sharing with them. Quite right, too. Um, so here are some of the conversations that they have. Example one. This is her translation. Not yesterday, not yesterday, but long ago a thing occurred. One night three men were keeping watch outside the homestead of the great chief, when suddenly they saw the former chief approach them. One asked, why was he no longer their chief? He was dead, I explained. That is why they were troubled and afraid when they saw him. Impossible, began one of the elders, handing his pipe to, onto his neighbour, who interrupted. Of course it wasn't the dead chief, it was an omen sent by a witch. Go on. Um, one of these three uh, was a man who knew things, the closest translation for scholar, but unfortunately it also meant witch. The second elder looked triumphantly at the first. <laughs> so he spoke to the dead chief, saying, Tell us what we must do so you may rest in your grave. But the dead chief did not answer. He vanished and they could see him no more. Then the man who knew things, who na whose name was Horatio, said this event was the affair of the dead chief's son, Hamlet. There was a general shaking of heads round the circle. Had the dead chief no living brothers, or was his son the chief? No, I replied. That is, he had one living brother who became the chief when the elder brother died. The old men muttered. Such omens were matters for chiefs and elders, not for youngsters. No good could come out of going behind a chief's back. Clearly, Horatio was not a man who knew things. <laughs> Part two. Uh, by the way, she skips the soliloquy entirely. <laughs> it all, it, she, she gets, you know, a few minutes into telling the story and things are already going so horribly awry, she just decides that's not worth attempting anyway. Um, so, next. Hamlet followed his dead father off to one side. When they were alone, Hamlet's dead father spoke. Omens can't talk, the old man was emphatic. Hamlet's dead father wasn't an omen. Seeing it might have been an omen, but he was not. My audience looked as confused as I sounded. It was Hamlet's dead father. It was a thing we call a ghost. I had to use the English word, for unlike many of the neighboring tribes, these people didn't believe in the survival after death of any individuating part of the personality. What is a ghost, an omen? No, a ghost is someone who is dead, but who walks around and can talk, and people can hear him and see him, but not touch him. In and of, that's an interesting definition of a ghost. But um, They objected, but one can touch zombies. No, no, it wasn't a dead body that witches had animated to sacrifice and eat. Uh, no one else made Hamlet's dead father walk, he did it himself. Dead men can't walk, protested my audience as one man. Part the third. The great chief wanted to know what was wrong with Hamlet, so he sent for two of Hamlet's age mates. School friends would have taken a long explanation. To talk to Hamlet and find out what troubled his heart. Hamlet, seeing that they had been bribed by, and, uh, bribed by the chief to betray him, told them nothing. Polonius, however, insisted that Hamlet was mad because he had been forbidden to see Ophelia, whom he loved. Why, inquired a bewildered voice, should anyone bewitch Hamlet on that account? Bewitch him? Yes. Only witchcraft can make anyone mad, unless, of course, one sees the beings that lurk in the forest. Indeed. Four. <laughs> she, she fights her way to the end of Hamlet with immense struggle and many interjections. Uh, they find it absurd. Um, and finally, the elder says, after they've debated many, many points of the text, you tell the story well, and we are listening, but it is clear that the elders of your country have never told you what the story really means. No, don't interrupt. We believe you when you say your marriage customs are different, or your clothes and weapons, but people are the same everywhere. Therefore, there are always witches, and it is we, the elders, who know how witches work. We told you it was the great chief who wished to kill Hamlet, and now your own words have proved us right. Sometime, concluded the old man, gathering his rag toga about him, you must tell us some more of your stories of your country. We who are elders will instruct you in their true meaning. So that when you return to your own land, your elders will see that you have not been sitting in the bush, but among those who know things and who have taught you wisdom. <laughs> and I think they were quite right, actually. <laughs> and clearly Bohannon did learn a thing or two from this experience about the, the universal nature of people and the, 
the clear shared understanding. We all have a, the key texts. I mean, yes, there are ambiguous texts, but Hamlet's not one of those, surely. Um, so yes, what, what she has to learn, perhaps not just specifically about witches, but it's about the nature of linguistic and textual translation across cultural boundaries. A tragedy is only tragic when you don't think all the protagonists are acting out of farce. Uh, and in light of the things that we've kind of already been discussing yesterday and earlier today, I don't purport that there's anything especially revelatory, so to speak, um, about this particular ethnography. I think we, we're kind of quite clear on the issues it, it raises. But I think it does serve to highlight, in a sense, the, the universality of the particularity of translation issues. Now, now to Sanskrit. Um, so with these issues in mind, uh, for my next section, I'd like to show you how this affects the actual practicing work of a Sanskritist when they're dealing with a Sanskrit translation. And one of the things that I feel at points maybe we've, we've acknowledged but skirted around throughout on what I was stressing at the start is how much we really, at some stage, directly or indirectly, are dependent upon lexicons and dictionaries for our work as translators. Even when we're learning from somebody much more knowledgeable about that language, well, where did they acquire that knowledge of that language? At some point, somewhere along, everyone has had to sit down and go through this mechanical process and use the available tools that we have to aid our work. So since Sanskrit is a key classical Indo-European language, it's probably really the oldest, uh, bar Hittite, oldest attested textually Indo-European language, an enormously large, rich textual tradition available to us, immaculate, absolutely immaculate preservation and transmission over many, many centuries to, to an incredible degree. And people who essentially kind of came up with their own derivational linguistics at a very early stage, about 1,500 years before Europe had, had any such thoughts. They already had algorithms for analysing grammar. Um, in fact, a lot of our, our, not only our modern science of language studies, but a lot of our ideas about algorithmic thinking does come from Parmeni and his grammatical tradition. I say Parmeni, it's not going to be written down anywhere, not as I've had many a conversation. Um, what does Panini have to do with grammar? Um, but being an Indo-European language and a culture with which actually there are many exchanges in the general classical Indo-European world, you'd think translation issues might not be quite as substantial as rendering Hamlet into Tiv. Um, so this comes to really I think, the perennial question for translators and lexicologists everywhere, which is, of course, when is a pigeon a monkey? And, uh, and, and other tales. Uh, so to show you the difficulty that you get working with Sanskrit, what I did is I sat down on Saturday and I opened a random page of the standard Sanskrit English dictionary by Monier Williams, late 19th century. It's still kind of the go-to text for English translation of Sanskrit. Um, I, well, the first time I opened it, it actually fell open on the, the middle pages of meanings of to be. So. The, Abandoned that and reopened. Um, I didn't want to shoot myself in the foot, really. <laughs> I went through the pages. I found a noun. Thought that'd be a bit easier to work with on meanings and dealing with a verb or an adjective. So I picked a noun that I felt really reflects the norms of Sanskrit lexicography. And I mean, it, it really is true. So I wanted to show what kind of possibilities this presents to a translator. Here is the word. I picked. <coughs> Parabata occurs in the masculine, the feminine, with a long e ending, and in the neuter. It's from para, uh, Greek para, uh, plus vat. It's uh, an ending which also gives it a kind of um, more, can, can give it a nominal form, can give it an adjectival form. Remote, distant, coming from a distance, foreign. Avi, the Rig Veda. So this is the core text of the Vedic religious tradition. The Vedic religion is the one upon which the Hindu tra traditions are derived, Brahminical beliefs. Um, it's a corpus of 1,028 hymns, uh, some more accessible than others, shall we say, but you all know what that's like working with ancient texts. Um, we also have here instrumental plural, instrumental just a a nominal declension by means of through from distant quarters, 
AV, the Atharva Veda. This is the fourth of the four core Vedas in the Vedic religion. It's one much more concerned with kind of magical rites and practices, you know, healing, warding spells, things like that. Um, okay, that's actually, that's not too bad. What have we got next? Masculine, personal name of a tribe on the Yamuna, a river, according to the Rig Veda. And also the, which, which one is that? That's the Tanja Brahmana. Brahmanas are a body of commentarial literature, kind of explaining and performing exegesis on the Vedas. Okay, even that, actually, that's not too bad. What, what's our name for this tribe off on the Yamuna, far away? Well, we call them the Foreigns. You know. Yeah, okay, we can work with that. Conceptually, we, we can deal with that. that that's not too, too bizarre. Uh, yeah, 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 I think you've got the foreigners in your text too, don't you? <laughs> they must be the same people. <laughs> Which, in fact, to Carians, that's a whole other story, <laughs> who they've been mistaken for. Um, IFC, so at the end of a compound, when it's in the feminine long R form, it's a turtle dove or a pigeon. Starting to push it a bit now. Um, see, what's our, our textual source for that? Okay, the Mahabharata. A classicist are very fond of Homer, of course, quite rightly. But when we talk about epics in Sanskrit, we mean epic. The Mahabharata is the great epic of India, and it's 100,000 verses of epic. Um, and that's just the critical edition. Obviously, there are regional variants, dozens of regional variants of differing lengths, entirely different content in some sections of them. Um, it's a biggie. It's a big text. But apparently, somewhere in there, the word paravata does occur at the end of a compound, and it very clearly means pigeon. This is also true in Kavya, uh, the, the genre of, of high poetry, essentially. It's a kind of snake, of course. Where else do you go from pigeon? Um, what text tells us this is a kind of snake? Uh, it's the Shushruta Sanghita, which is the classical work on surgery in ancient India. It's, it's where we know anything that we do about surgical practices in the subcontinent. Um, it's also the personal name of a Naga of the race of Airavata, uh, according to the Mahabharata again. So earlier it was telling us at the end of compound it's a pigeon. Now it's the name of a Naga, a, kind of a serpent demon, um, who belongs to this particular Airavata race. Yeah, monkey. Of course, we, we only had three kinds of unrelated animal so far for this word, as well as a, as a serpent demon, um, the foreigns, and things that are far away. The L in this context, in Monia Williams, indicates lexicographer. Who is he referring to when he says lexicographer? Well, actually, in his notes at the start of the dictionary, he explains these are the native lexicographers with whom he was working, or his assistants were working so that as he was trying to acquire all the vocabulary that he wanted for the dictionary, this would say, well, what does this mean? And they would inform him with their knowledge as na native speakers. I mean, this is a whole question of Sanskrit as a natural language, well, you know, as a natural spoken language. I would say it's a literary and liturgical language. I mean, people weren't teaching Parninian grammar to their babies, it would be cruel. Um, it's, <laughs> It's a very learned language, certainly the Brahmins would have spoken it, much the way that ecclesiastical Latin was spoken in learned communities, but it certainly wasn't your first given language growing up. And a lot of Sanskritists would agree with that, a lot wouldn't. But he's clearly talking to pundits, from, from whence English gets the word to. Um, and they're absolutely certain it means monkey. Then it's, of course, the Diospiros Embryopteris, uh, which I had to go and root around as to what on earth that was. Um, commonly called ebony or persimmons tree. So this is the persimmons tree. Uh, what text tells us that? Again, it's the Mahabharata. So, so far, in the Mahabharata, which to be fair is big, but it's, it's a serpent demon, a pigeon, and a persimmons tree. This is corroborated, apparently, by the Harivanksha, um, 
a text very closely related to the Mahabharata, consider it a kind of epilogue to it for now, it's easier. But also the Sushruta Sanghita says this. So, okay, well, why is this word a kind of snake? Well, we can't even get our heads around that for now. But the fact that snakes are getting discussed in a surgical text maybe makes sense. You've got to deal with snake bites. That's probably a reason that's been getting discussed. Simmons trees, I believe, you're not actually meant to eat the fruit of. So presumably there's a passage somewhere along the lines when they're discussing what you need to do when somebody's eaten the fruit of the persimmons. And this word again occurs. It's a mountain, word for a mountain, not the name of a mountain, otherwise we'd have a, a capital N, it's just a word for a mountain. Again, from lexicographer. It's the plural personal name of a class of deities under Manusva Rochisha. Okay, um, and this is in the Puranas, uh, this is Vedantic, Vedantic literature, around the same period as the epics, a uh, lot collection of theological narratives. And this feminine form, first mentioned at the start when it's Purarati, uh, means it's the fruit of the Yavaroha Asida, according to a lexicographer. I doubt he used that term. Um, again, I had to go and look that one up. And it goes by various different region specific names, all of which is Tahitian gooseberry tree or wherever gooseberry tree. Not actual gooseberries as we know them, um, but just a tree that produces a very similar yellowy fruit, uh, which is very sharp tasting not actually commonly eaten, apparently, as a kind of food, but used as, as flavouring. It's an exciting discovery I was making through Wikipedia, an interesting also research resource. Um, <laughs> it's a form of song peculiar to cow herds. <laughs> of course it is. It's anything at this point, really, isn't it? So why not be <laughs> a song peculiar to cow herds? I didn't even know cow herds had songs, let alone ones that were peculiar to them. If that's what it actually means, you know. <laughs> is it a kind of song only sung by cow herds? Or one, a, a peculiar song within the repertoire of songs known to cow herds? I don't know. And I have a, a pretty distinct feeling Monio Williams didn't either, actually. Um, it's also a personal name applied to, to a river. And I think... Oh, no, no, no. One more. <laughs> it's also the fruit of the Diosporos Embrypopteris. Um, so it's both the tree and the word for the fruit of the tree, which is very odd, and actually that's, that's just not Sanskrit. You know, the, why, when you could have so many more words added into the vocabulary? And there's a point that's generally understood among Indologists that for every word there are 50 different meanings, and for every concept there are at least 50 different words to describe it. This is the reality that you have when working with a Sanskrit dictionary. As I said at the start, this is not a particularly anomalous kind of entry to come across. It really isn't. I'm not saying every, you know, every time you look up a word, this goes on. But it happens an awful lot, more often than not. Um, so, as people who practice translation often in some form or other, we all know that when it comes to encountering an unfamiliar word, especially with numerous divergent meanings, I don't know, consensus for speakers of other languages, how often do you get something this divergent listed under one word in a dictionary? You get it quite often, too. Really? Completely different words all under the same word in the dictionary. Now that's interesting. Yeah. Because, oh, no, no, sir. Oh, yeah. I was thinking if you were working in a foreign language and you looked up English words, of course, you'd like that. Yes, yes, in fact, in English is probably one of the ones more guilty of this kind of thing, in fact. But, you know, from, from my experience, you know, this wasn't happening when I was trying to learn Greek. You don't get this in a Norse dictionary or an old Persian dictionary. Um, even Tikarian, and Tikarian's a ghastly, but, you know, th this doesn't happen. Um, is it explicable by the period over which the corpus, the period the corpus represents overall? Well, this is one of the things that I think is really important and really interesting, is actually, you know, Monio Williams does us the service of giving textual citation wherever possible. Vague uh, textual citation, I mean, like the Rig Veda, as I say, that's 1,028 hymns. This word means these three different things in the Mahabharata. What, uh, which Mahabharata? 
And where in the 100,000 verses of it does it mean this? What's the context? So we, we don't get that. That's probably asking, frankly, a bit much. I mean, the, the man was incredibly ill for the last years of his life and essentially held on to finish the dictionary and then not long after could finally, finally die. And I, I expect with an enormous sense of relief on his part that he, <laughs> he was free of the Sanskrit dictionary. And I'm sure it played no small part in his declining health. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, this does happen. We, we encounter these kind of problems to some degree or other, and we use context to, de to decide the most plausible meaning. And you know, we've discussed this a lot. Um, what do we actually mean when we say you know, we find the plausible meaning, the, the, the sensible reading in the text, and we use academic euphemism and say, well, oh, it's a contextual reading, or it's a context-sensitive analysis within the discursive framework, which is, yes, fine, well and good. Um, what, <laughs> what are we saying? We're saying it's a, it's a very well-educated guess. Um, we're, we're using our common sense, our intuition, of our, our understanding of the text, of the textual tradition, of the words. But again, I'm asking, do we? Where does that come from? That common sense surely is nothing more than the collection of cultural norms we use to negotiate meaning. More often than not, we do it quite unreflexively as well, actually. Now, at Oxford, we have something just shy of 9,000 Sanskrit manuscripts in the collection. It's the largest collection outside of the subcontinent. And as somebody whose work is more kind of curatorial, shall we say, than, than conventionally academic, you know, part of my work is receiving requests from scholars outside of the institution, saying things like, I'm studying classical Indian ethnobotany, and I wondered if you could tell me what manuscripts you have in your collection that mention the persimmons tree. <laughs> well, you can tell what they'd probably get in response. In fact, I did get <laughs> a request really not dissimilar to that, where somebody said, can you let me know which manuscripts you have with the word pushpa, uh, most often meaning flower. We're, but let's not do another entry. I think you've, you've experienced enough of that. But most often, yeah, OK, it's flower. Well, these aren't digitized. You know, I'm working on this at the moment. It's digitizing the catalogs, not, not the manuscripts themselves, but just getting our catalog entries in a searchable electronic format. Um, it's a, not as pleasant a task as I imagined when it started. Um, that will then be possible, more or less, once you can do that, because you can search for pushpart within the terms and see what you've got. But actually knowing you know, in this huge corpus where these kinds of things occur is nigh impossible, and it's enough to drive you to hand in your notice. Um, but I now, with this in mind, with, you, you can understand what happens as a Sanskritist now, when, to some extent, when you're sitting down and you're looking at text and you've got some very unfamiliar territory, you've got your dictionary to hand, because that's the only real informational source you've got available to you, and you actually start applying this stuff to translating a piece of text. And that's actually what I'm going to do next. And actually, John used the same example earlier, which I was, I was pleased of. It makes for a, a nice, interesting comparison now. As we all know, uh, from Genesis, on the first day, God created heaven and earth and light and dark. And the Lord said, enough of that light. I'm sure this is an agreed meaning. Uh, or when Hari Metzal, uh, the Hebrew Bible in Hindu Sanskrit. <laughs> Good film fans. <laughs> so, I'm going to give you... So, the, the, the Bible was translated into Sanskrit by Christian missionaries in Calcutta, mid-19th century. I, I've only read a small part of it. I now want to read all of it. It, it was such an interesting experience. But um, here's where we begin. Sorry, the red was a bad decision in the end. Um, but, Adita Ishwaro Akashang Pritivincha Sasarja Pritivinijarna Shunya Chashit Andakarashcha Gambira Jalasyo Pari Tasyao Tadanin Ishwarasyatma Toyani Vyapyasit Anantaram Dipti Bhavatu Iti. Hmm. So, what, what have we got here? Um, what I've put up in terms of the English translation is, I think, more or less NIV. Yes, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's where I took it from. Um, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon its deep waters. Then the Spirit of God reached out across the waters and God said, let there be light. Anyone see any problems coming? We're tackling this. Now, of course, there isn't, to the best of my knowledge, I certainly couldn't find one, an English translation of the Sanskrit translation of the Hebrew Bible. That's a bit excessive. I think it probably makes sense why nobody sat down and done that project. But I really want to now that I've tried it. Um, <laughs> so what I did was I sat down. I, I tried not to ruminate on the fact that I know how Genesis begins and I know what those words are. I just took the printed volume, I sat down in the British Library with a nice first edition Sanskrit Bible, and I opened it up and I transliterated it like that. And I sat down and I went through the dictionary and even for the words that I was absolutely sure of the meaning of, I went and looked up the possibilities that were presented to me by the text. And if you'll uh, allow me to indulge, I'd just like to, to read you my understanding of Genesis 1. Verse 1 to 3. Initially, the husband took interest on the money he lent the earth and the sky. The earth was destitute and vacant-eyed, and the darkness. He was beyond deep waters, the depth of a man's navel. He was splayed across those waters. Then the husband said, enough of this brass. <laughs> I'm sure it's very familiar, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't the only reading, by, by no means. And this is a slightly more salacious one. Uh, it's probably what would have happened if you'd had uh, an English translation of the Sanskrit translation of the Bible done by Kenneth Williams or Frankie Howard. But here we go, cover your ears if you, if you prefer. At first, the God of love discharged soil and ethereal fluids. The soil was unpeopled and barren, full of darkness, approaching a watery hiccup. At that time, the eternal soul of the God of love permeated the waters. Then the God of love said, good, the flash-like flight of an arrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the watery hiccup that the, <laughs> the God of love was presented with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can see there are some problems. Um, it's, I'm, I'm rather brutally hammering the point home here, obviously, and it's not my intention to be facetious. In fact, I actually think it's a pretty good translation. They say it's translated from the Hebrew uh, on the opening pages of it. I'm doubtful about that. I, know, I have no, no basis to make that claim. Um, I can't, can't challenge what they've said, but it seems very unlikely to me that English missionaries whose first scholarly language is probably Latin more than anything in the mid-19th century. Of course, they will have known Hebrew and Greek, given what they were doing. But that they just went Hebrew into Sanskrit without that being mediated by their own mother tongue seems very unlikely. I don't think we are actually capable of doing that, of just simply not thinking in our own language at all and going from language A to language B, source to target. Um, so clearly, you know, that's influenced their way of thinking. But I do want to kind of look a bit at actually what, what we've got there. Um, so, actually, can anyone take a stab at any of that? I mean, in terms of recognise what any words might be there? What's the word for God there? Uh, Ishvaro. Oh. Um, which, here we go, I didn't did note them all down. Ishvaro. God, supreme being, supreme soul. That's according to uh, Manu Smriti, um, and I th think the Yajna Veda. Um, Manu Smriti, the laws of Manu, kind of a manual of correct and proper behavior, essentially. It's, it's kind of a, a Hindu Leviticus of rules, um, which very worryingly, and this is a lot to do with the educational tradition we have for Indian languages, well, in, Indian religion and culture in the West that comes all the way from this time and, and still persists, is I, I learned from a friend who is a school RS teacher, children are taught oh, the laws of Manu is a very important text in the Hindu tradition. No, it's not. Nor has it ever particularly been. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't matter. The Mahabharata is what matters. I mean, the Mahabharata claims to be the fifth Veda, that anything that there is to be known is in there, and anything that's not in the Mahabharata isn't in existence to be known anyway, so it doesn't matter. It's a pretty bold claim from a text, but you know, 
that large, it might just be possible that it does have all of the knowledge in it. Um, manuscript is not really an authoritative text. Uh, other meanings, husband, which I used in one of my uh, less than successful translations, that what translations make Google Translate actually look pretty good. Um, but the Mahabharata tells us that this is where we get husband from. It can also mean Shiva, um, who you'll be familiar with, isn't it? Brahma and Vishnu and Shiva, Shiva the creator and destroyer. Uh, also the god of love, which I used. It's also the word apparently for number 11. I just couldn't find a way to use that one as much as I was going to try. <laughs> What's the word for reached out? Because that verb is a bit... Ah, yes, yes. Uh, Vyapyasit. So the eat there is coming from the perfective. The root verb is asked to be... Uh, Let's just check all the other there on that. Uh, yeah, to, to be, to be present. Um, to live, exist, abide, happen. Yeah, to be. <laughs> that verb, that problematic verb. And V and api are just prefixes. So the, the it goes to the uh, um, when followed by a vowel. So it's giving a sense of it kind of Emitting from, coming out forth. Spreading out? Yes, yes, spreading out. And hence you can also get, you know, splayed, um, uh, permeated, emitted, discharged. That's hovering. That's closer to the Hebrew than the English. Really? Yes. And to me, Artnihar at the beginning is very interesting because it maintains the ambiguity of the Hebrew because it's sort of adverbally. Yes. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that yeah, is what it's doing there. Hebrew's ambiguous on So, okay, so this verb... You could justify some of this coming directly from Hebrew commentary. That, that's really interesting because I, no, I just don't know. I don't have Hebrew. I, I, can't, I can't compare. Um, the sound, I mean, it's, it's pretty good Sanskrit. It's a, it's a bit odd sometimes in places. There are vocabulary choices I wouldn't necessarily have made. Um, but it, it holds up well. I think they've done a very good job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You wait for my edition of this. <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> Anyone knows any research councils wanting to fund my endeavour, please do get in touch. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that verb, the um, V plus up, E plus us, uh, emit from oneself, which I found very interesting meaning, actually. Um, the, the idea that you know, creation is being emitted from Ishvaro, himself. Um, also procure, bestow, obtain, take interest on money lent, hang on to, uh, in its parasmipida form, it's kind of act, act form, it can also mean discharge, hurl at, publish. Quite like the idea that God published heaven and earth. Um, <laughs> but you know, my impression from, from looking at this and analysing it is that Ishvaro is chosen because it means God or supreme being in Manu Smriti. And they like Manu Smriti. The, you know, the, the, the British Empire, while there, that's the kind of text they can work with. It's nice, good, heavy duty legal text. It shows that they clearly are, in spite of being terribly primitive, a, actually quite a sophisticated literary culture. And, you know, and there's a lot of literature from the period. It just doesn't understand what went wrong with the Indians, I mean, or the Hindus. Um, always with a double O, which is just an orthographic convention of the time, but when you read it, you always just kind of go... <laughs> um, yes, but they were so impressed by the vastness and the sophistication of their, their literary culture that, you know, they were actually, for their time and their context, actually very respectful of the culture and really wanted to, to work with it. So they were considering the Rig Veda and Manu Smriti as the important authoritative text from which to take an idea of meanings when doing this, I mean, it's almost certain. You're, you're trying to render a, a sacred text into another language that has a completely different religious tradition, and a very different language, full of complexities. How do you make that work? How do you get the register right? Well, presumably, by using language from similarly sacred texts. Okay, that makes sense. And uh, among the Brahminical class, the priestly class, that certainly probably would have worked very well. Um, Heavens, what's that in the Hebrew? And what? And oh, okay. <laughs> so, 
Well, yes, yeah, so here, they, it, what they've used is Akasham, um, free or open space, vacuity. And this is according to the Brahmanas, the, the exegetical literature, and, uh, and according to the Mahabharata. It can also mean ether, sky, atmosphere, the subtle and ethereal fluids supposed to fill and pervade the universe and be the particular vehicle of life and sound, according to the Vedantas, the post-Vedic literature, um, also means Brahma. So Brahma as the personified form of Brahman, the underlying principle of the universe. Um, it's an interesting choice of word to make for this, actually. So, I guess, <laughs> God. <laughs> My readings there, obviously, were quite daft. Um, but they were close to being viable readings. I made the lexical decisions, and then sometimes the grammar had to be fudged to hold it up. But we can all do that as well, you know, in the act of translation. Sometimes you can't strictly adhere to the grammar. It just doesn't work in your target language. So you mold things a little bit. Um, and of course, the result is ridiculous in this case. But for anyone who reads Sanskrit and comes from a cultural background heavily influenced by Judeo-Christian traditions, I include myself in that, you know, it would be very quickly evident from the Sanskrit text what the source material is and how it's meant to be read. You know, when I looked at it and I, I could fill in most of the words, I was like, well, obviously it's Genesis, and it's been done fairly well. Um, but without that context, indeed that educated common sense, uh, the standard translation is not especially preferable to any number of other translations that could be made, particularly for vocabulary like God, spirit, heavens, earth, void. You know, there's an enormous amount of room for interpretation, even within doing that within your area, within biblical studies, obviously you're faced with that, let alone when you're doing it into something like Sanskrit and you're mediating through English. Um, and I think, actually, that text probably wouldn't make very much sense to a mid-19th century Indian laity. Because the texts they know are the Mahabharata and the Hitopadesha, you know, that it's the animal fables and the epics and it's the Ramayana, you know, it's the story of you know, Rama and Sita. And it, this is the literature they know really well. Um, so those quite archaic, stuffy, canonical... So and, yeah. Yeah, I, I find it very Brahminical kind of Sanskrit to look at, actually, in that context. It's not, I don't think, a, a, a lay accessible translation, necessarily. And part of the, you know, the question will be, how is it delivered to them? Bearing in mind, they don't speak Sanskrit anyway. You know, only the priestly class do, so, you know. Do you know how widely uh, read and digested this particular translation? No, I... I no, I found that quite hard to track down. I want to keep trying as well, because I think it's a really interesting point. But, I mean, presumably this did have a big impact. I mean, it, it must have taken hold in terms of convincing enough of the Brahminical caste to convert to Christianity. Now, presumably, they were actually using vernacular modern Indian languages to convey it to a lot of people, or they were using the Sanskrit version to show the, the kind of authorial, authoritative sacred nature of the text to the Brahminical class, who would then render in their own language to the laity, you know, whether it was Punjabi or Gujarati or Hindi, you know, would, would communicate the sense of the text. And you know, I, I want to do, really want to do some research into this now, um, just, just because it's been, all I wanted to do was a fascinating exercise in what happened with a dictionary. And, and really to raise this point, the one that we, you know, we've only half mentioned is, these are, these are our you know, Bibles of translation. Um, can we trust them? If a pigeon is a snake and a monkey and a river, how do we go about composing these texts themselves and how do we use them from there? So that's all I wanted to, to throw out to you. Yeah, that sounds very. He lovely. also had one, he also had a local person 
working with him on the translations. Mm -hmm. uh, William Jones, you know, the, the, one of the early Orientalists, very famously made the, the great statement to the Royal Asiatic Society about the relationship between Sanskrit and Greek and Latin. He worked his whole life in India very closely with the same group of pundits who did a lot of, taught him his knowledge of Sanskrit, but also worked in... Yeah, he did a lot of the work on, on botanical... Ah. If it is, if it is Pali, then... I'm pretty sure it is. 